16 when this baby came out so <laughs> look out really I, I was like you know i started like with jazz you know and then in the local store i was like man okay i gotta check this out and i was blown away i listened to that like transcribed tried to transcribe oh man yeah. thank you yeah so, so thanks for taking the time appreciate it it's my pleasure i appreciate the compliments um so yes yeah, so i've been working i've been working a lot i um i've already made Two trips to Europe, uh, two trips to Spain. I made two trips to Spain in July to play with. Oh, really? um, oh, wow. Yeah, I have a, a, a project that I've been doing for years with uh, a, a promoter there named Jordi Suño. The, the project is four or five guitars together with organ and drums. Oh, man. So it started out uh, more than 10 years ago. The first one was Chuck Loeb, myself, Russell Malone, and Pat Martino. Wow, seriously? Yeah, we did uh, a couple of concerts in France and uh, uh, and in Norway, uh, oh. uh, maybe about uh, a little over ten years ago, and then then for, then it, it uh, you know then it, uh, uh, Pat Martino didn't do any more and Russell didn't do any more. So uh, um, actually, now to Chuck Lowe, uh, and, and then unfortunately, shortly after passed, Chuck away. passed away. But uh, um, I did some, you know, I kept it going with um, Philip Catherine. Uh, and and uh, Ulf Wakanius, the guitar player from from Sweden. Uh, um, so it was myself, Philip, Ulf, and I, I. And I misspoke. Larry did do. Larry Correll did do some more some more gigs with us. So it was myself, Larry, wow. uh, uh, Philip, and, and, and Ulf. We did we did me three or four years of those. And Larry and I got to be very good friends. Uh, I, you know, I was a big fan of his from when I was a kid. Yeah, and he was just as nutty. And crazy, you know, in 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 his sixties, and as I remember seeing him or thinking he would be when I saw him when he was in his twenties, you know. Uh, uh, but just, oh, man. Uh, he, you know, it's funny. I don't often talk about Larry, but for some reason he's on my mind today. He he was uh, uh, one of the most consummate students of jazz guitar that I'd ever known. You know, I, I um, people talk about you know different aspects of different people's playing and so forth, and I saw him. Doing everything from playing an ovation yeah. with with um, with John McLaughlin and, and, and Paco, you know, to, to uh, um, playing straight ahead with his hollow body with Jimmy Smith, you know, uh, yeah. um, and things in between. But I remember once we, we were we were at a double bill concert, and he was telling he, he came and he's like Mark, you know, he talked funny. He's like Mark, you know, I've been I've been transcribing these West Montgomery solos, and I don't know, and, and when I play them, they don't sound like him. And I was like, well, uh, okay, well, but you play something for me. Right, it's like I gotta see that. I just want to see if you would do it, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you know and so there he is. He, he starts playing West's solo from West, you know, West Coast West Coast Blues, yeah. and I, and he, he played it perfectly. I said, "But Larry, you're using using four fingers." And he's like, "Oh, that's right. West only used three fingers, right?" And you think you would think it would take somebody like you know a while. He's like, "Oh," and he switched right away and played oh, the entire man. solo with three fingers. Man, and it sounded just like West, and I was like. Wow, I didn't expect that. <laughs> nah, gee. And so, so you know, I, I I I learned to help. I learned over the years. Not that I would have challenged it anyway, but to always have a healthy amount of respect for those guys who have come before yeah. you, because you never really know how hard they worked or what they worked on to get to be who they are. You know, no one, especially back in those days, guys just didn't show up and get a career or a record deal handed to them. They, sure, they put in their time, you know. Also, it's beautiful you play with Philip Catran. You know, he's such oh. an under, underrated player, I think, in the world of jazz, especially in the States, maybe. I mean, well, in the States, yeah. yeah. He's, he's uh, you know, he's a, he's an underrated guy, an uh, under, understated guy. Yeah. You know, he, he um, he's just super passionate about the music. Uh, and almost, almost to the point where he doesn't really care much about the presentation of anything he just yeah. he plays great and every you know i post it's funny um from the first concert we did uh back in the early july i posted like a 15 or 20 second snippet of him playing lover man at the sound check you know on my instagram wow, beautiful. and it got like sixteen thousand likes you know 
you know, and I was like, man, I've been on here for years and never, you know, I never, you know, and I put, I put literally, you know, 30 seconds of Philip Catherine and he just wipes my entire IG out, you know, I just, but, it's, you know, uh, uh, but that's, that's just him. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, it wasn't even him solo, it was him kind of playing the melody and his, and his tone and his passion and his whole soul was in every note. And, and, uh, um, and yeah, I remember, uh, and the first time I really, you know, I, I, we did the concert together uh, with this group, you know, it might been, I think it was Larry, Philip, and, and, and Old Fuacanius, oh, yeah. uh, and, and we did one, and then the next one we did, um, uh, Philip was like, hey, man, I want to ask you something about how you, you know, hold the pick or something, and I was just like, and this was really, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I, at that point, I, w I wanted to hold him between my toes, if, he, you know, if, he, if he'd stop looking at me, you know, it made me nervous, and so he says, come by my room, so I got my guitar, and I go by his room, and he wanted to play Stella by Starlight, I'm like, okay, great, right. so we start playing, and he started soloing, and I just wouldn't let him stop. I just kept comping and comping and comping. And finally, he says, I invited you here so I could see how you hold the pick. And I was like, man, forget how I hold the pick. Just don't stop playing. Like, it was the just, lines, every, yeah. every chorus was just, uh, um, was a master class, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I've had uh, uh, yeah. experiences like that. You know, this, this my, my inspiration for doing this, and you can stop me anytime and ask questions. It's okay. I'll no, 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 it's so beautiful. It just, just go, I, I'm. I'm like a small kid, man. Like, all right, all right. You know, um, when I was a kid, I played bass, right? I played the upright bass, mostly classical music. Uh, and my, I got into those Pablo records, you know, that was Ray yeah, Brown. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, you know, uh, and and of course there was Joe Pass just waiting for me, right? Joe, you know, Joe Pass and Herb Ellis, uh, which led me to, led me get to get into Barney Kessel and and you know and and and. Uh, um, uh, Charlie Bird, you know, the, those great yeah. guitar records, you know, and so I, I, um, I had the opportunity to, to play with Charlie, myself with Charlie Bird and, um, the guitar, the guy from, from, from Norway, uh, uh, uh like a uh, straight ahead guitar. Yeah. More of a fusion guy That's from Tadia, Tadia, Tadia Ribdo? No. No, 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 um, I, uh, a really big guy. He looked like he could have been in, in the in the world's strongest man competition. Like his name should have been Magnus Magnuson. And I feel terrible now for not remembering not remembering his name. But I love me too. <laughs> really? But uh, uh, anyway, I, and he and he was just he was wonderful, you know. And I remember, and I remember playing. And Charlie Bird started. Te he was teasing me. He said, "Cause you know, cause I was I, I was." basically sitting in Barney Kessel's chair, you know, and, and he just, and I was wearing this crazy outfit, like these black and white checkerboard pants, this bright, bright yeah. red coat. And I didn't, I had, you know, this, you remember, I'm, I'm 54 now, so. Oh man, really? Uh, we grew up without the internet, right? So, you know, I, I didn't have, if you if you didn't see these guys in person, you just didn't see them. It wasn't, no, there were no videos and things, you know? And so, uh, um, uh, he said, it really was really funny is, you dress like you dress like Barney Kessel, and I was like, I dress like. What does that mean? And then I, later I saw pictures. I was like, Oh my god! <laughs> you know, the pictures of him with like the, the polyester, you know, the crazy, yeah. you know, all the ascots and the wild colors. And I was like, I had to change that right away. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but but I, oh man! So, but I, you know, those. It, the one thing about you know, people always talk about the challenge of playing as a guitar player with a piano player, you know, yeah, well, yeah. you know, you get, uh, that's nothing, that's child's play compared to sitting up on stage with three other guitar players. Yeah, man. And, and you got four, four, you know, basic virtuosos and an organ and drums and, and make, to make, to make music. Those are some of the most rewarding experiences of my life, you know, and yeah, so man, I, man. I, 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 I'm so grateful, especially for Philip, because because he's such a stickler for precision. And, you know, he brought an arrangement of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And, and, oh, and man, we were all kind of like, you know, I mean, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful classic song and we all know it. So we're all kind of like half stage. He's like, no, 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 no. You play the, this is your part and you have to play. And, and we, we must have rehearsed it for 20 minutes. I was like, oh my God, we're still rehearsing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. But the point was uh, when, when we got, when we played it at the concert, it, it, it literally was a standing ovation. Oh, okay. you know? and, and so people, um, People know that, yeah. Well, they know the tune, and, and 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 his point was, you know, if we if we really take pride in what we do, it will come through. You know, we, we're already great as musicians, so all we need to do is be really careful 
about what we play and the way we play it, and it makes a difference. And 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 in today's world, where there's so much competition for attention, yeah. Yeah. to me that 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 is the mo- one of the most important things is to really care, have have real care about about what you're doing and the way you do it, and it makes a difference. You know, I uh, I told the story the other day about uh, about Joe Pass, right? Because oh, I, I so I was uh, out of high school. Uh, I was. After 10th grade, I grew up on Long Island, you know, outside yeah. of New York City. Yeah. And after 10th grade, my parents, we, we retired and they moved to Seattle, Washington. This was 1982. So while Seattle is a cool city now, then it was a pumpkin patch, right? It was just, it was, you know, there was like, it was a, Boeing, I think, was there, you know, the, air, the, air, the, air, the, air, the aerospace manufacturer, that might have been it, you know. And, and so uh, um, there wasn't even Microsoft yet. Like it was just <laughs> Boeing, right? You know, yeah, early 80s, yeah, sure. Right, and so grunge was like you know. I'm pretty sure I saw. Not Kirk there. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw Nirvana playing at a, at a frat party. I'm almost positive I did. I can't. I couldn't say for sure. But if it wasn't there, it was someone who sounded a lot like them <laughs> playing for playing for a keg of beer, right? And so this was this is Seattle. So I, I moved there, uh, um, and I was still playing bass in the or- in the school orchestra. And we took a class trip to Disneyland down in California from Seattle, and. Uh, I got tired of the orchestra kids, so I was wandering around, you know, whatever, doing my thing in, in, in Disneyland. And I heard this noise that sounded like music, sounded like live music, right? And so I walked through the giant teacup land, you know, and they, and then they had, there was a little club there, like a, a mock jazz club. And I walked in oh, and, wow. there, and there was this guy at like three o'clock in the afternoon, sitting on a stool, playing guitar with eyes closed, rocking. It was Joe Pass. Nah, and they, really? they took this thing at Disneyland where they would bring in, um, with world-class music- musicians through the Musicians Union, and they, and they played little concerts at this club during the day, once a week, you know, and it oh, probably played yeah. great. And so I was only 15, and so I, I certainly wasn't going to talk to him, so I, I watched him play. And then the following year, I enrolled at Berkeley, and he came to Berkeley, and he gave a master class. I still didn't talk to him, I, 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 whatever, you know, I, was, I, I asked a question, because people were asking him dumb questions, you know, like, like what kind of strings do you use? And, you know, yeah. and he was a crazy and he was a cranky guy anyway, and so you you could tell he was frustrated. And so I asked him, I said, you know, how how do you how did you arrive at at this brilliant unaccompanied guitar style of yours? How you know, how did this yeah. come about? And he said, and it's the funniest thing. Uh, he said, well, back in the old days, you went to the union every morning, and you wait, you sat around until they assigned you a place to go play, right? He said, I went to the union, and I was supposed to go play with so and so orchestra, whatever it was, and and when signals got crossed. And I showed up at one place, and the band went to the other place, and I was by myself. Oh, wow, man. The club owner said, you, I want you to play. Now, we have people here. I need, I need music. He said, I, 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 you know. And he said, so I knew I, I knew a couple of things, you know, and I, and I just started playing solo guitar, you know, and he drew on some of his classical experience. And, and that basically is was the birth of his of his virtuoso style. All those virtuoso, it all came from that one experience, you know. And so, uh, so you know, I, I uh, fancied myself a real Joe Pass fanatic, and right? I'm getting into it the whole thing. And and then I graduated from college, and I and I moved back to New York, uh, and I was living in Brooklyn, and I saw that he was playing at the Blue Note, oh, solo wow. guitar, double billing with George wow. Shearing, George Shearing Quintet. Wow. So I had been working there in the late night jam session band. We made like fifteen dollars a piece a night. We played from like one a.m. to four a.m. You know, six nights a week. But be, but the perk was we could go to the club anytime yeah, as long as we please and listen and listen to the music for free. So I walk in. The doorman let me in. I went upstairs and, and uh, they were on a break. So I knocked on Joe Pass's dressing room door. I don't know, dude. I must have been out of my mind. I knocked on his door and my intent. I was going to ask him for a guitar lesson, right? So, so I'm, as I'm knocking on the door, you know, I hear him and one of his old buddies from the old days, you know, and they are, they're just having fun. But dude, they cur- they use the f bomb so many times in every sentence. I thought I was in an uncensored episode of The Sopranos. It was like, and the fucking, the fucking, and the fucking, oh my god! And I'm, when I've already started knocking on the door, I'm trying to unknock, right? I'm trying to like, you know, because now I'm scared to death, right? I'm like 21, I'm like, you know, and he's, the door flies open and, and there he is smoking a big cigar and he's like, what? You know, <laughs> you know he's looking at me and, 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 you know, you have to remember this is also a different social landscape, right? This is 1980, sure. Sure. 1987 and Joe had come up at a time 
when there was a real divide among, especially amongst guitar players, you know, black the school of black yeah. players, school of white players, the whole thing. And so he looks at me, he's like, what do you want? Like, like, like what are you doing here? You know, and, 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 and I said, well, hey, uh, sir, my name is Mark Whitfield. I'm a guitar player and I was hoping to get a lesson. And he says, a lesson? And he looks around and his buddy goes, hey, let him in, this ought to be fun. Right, and I'm like, oh God, this is worse, right? Because now they're going to destroy me, right? And, and I have no idea who his friend is, but I was like, oh God. So I walk in. I don't have a guitar. I, just, I walk in, and he slams the door. Clam slams behind me, and he and he sits down. He says, well, all right. Well, and he hands me his guitar, like his, you know, oh, the man, J- shit. Yeah. You know, prototype JV20. He puts it in my hands. All right, playing something. So I start playing this song. Uh, uh, it's something that I wrote for like my final recital at Berkeley or something, you know. It sounded like a standard, you know, but it wasn't. And I got about eight bars in and he says, hey, what, what's, what, what tune is this? You know, with a real scowl, you know, and, and, and I'm like, oh, it's this thing I wrote. He says, how the fuck can I tell you how you play if you don't play something I know? Play something I fucking know. And it's running. <laughs> and his buddy's in the corner going, oh, I told you this was going to be great, you know. Right? And I'm just, and I'm, and I'm trying to disappear, right? I'm just, I'm, one sure. of, I'm like, Scotty, want to beam up? <laughs> Give me, you know. And so, so I start playing. Uh, I had been re- I'd been working on an arrangement of We'll Be Together Again that day, right? I had my bass lines hooked up and like, I could play it in tempo. So I played a little line, I started playing, he's like, ah, now that's a song I know, I like it. He's like, yeah, kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now play, you know, play some lines for me. And I played a line, you know, and, and he stopped me, he said, oh, give me my guitar back. And he says, well, he says, you know, uh, uh, you actually, you sound a lot more like George Benson than you do like me. And I said, uh, and he says, but I, and, and, and I, you can tell I was, I was about to become defensive, but, but no, I love you. He didn't want to hear all that. He just said, but he said, you know, you, you've, you've been listening to the records and, and he says, obviously, you know how harmony, they, you, all he says, all you, all you can do is just keep practicing. Stick around, kid. It was nice meeting you. Right. And, and that was my cue. And dude, I, I couldn't have gotten out of the dressing room fast enough. Like, I, you know, <laughs> oh, I was out of that door like it was like there was a fire in there. Right. And the way the Blue Note in New York is set up, in case you haven't been there, is. Yeah, you know, sure. All right, so I'm standing on the stairs. And so he went, so he walked past me, didn't even see that, you know, whatever, walked past me, went on stage to play solo guitar, and he starts playing We'll Be Together Again. Oh, wow, man. And he played it for about 10 minutes. And every chorus, at the top of the chorus, he, would, he did see me. He would look up at me and smile, and then play something new. And wow. then he just kept, and he, it, was the, it was the most amazing masterclass I could have ever imagined, you know, and so, uh, um, and you know, and I, and I just, I didn't stick around to bother him till the end. I, you know, I stayed, I watched him play the whole thing, and then I, and then I went home, you know. And a few years later, I started making records, and I got to meet, got to see him again on the road, and he was, very, we got to be very friendly. You know? Oh really? Oh wow, man! He could talk, stick around, and talk to me, and leave me messages if I was coming to a place, you know, after him and all that. Beautiful. And but the whole point was. You know, I realized in in those moments that that uh, uh, this whole notion of having care about what you play and, be, and being an uh, being a real apprentice and yeah. looking at the heroes and 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 paying them respect by honoring the music as opposed to you know telling them how great they are. That, you know, yeah. like the lip service you get you know on on social media, for instance, yeah. uh, um, which is not a bad thing. It's wonderful, but the, but the proof is in the pudding. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so I I uh, the, the, that sort of of, of earnest uh, um, uh, activity, you know, it, it, it serves the music well, and it serves us well as individuals, and it helps to break break down barriers and break that, you know, and and, and bring the community together. <laughs> and, and the one good thing that I think came out of one of the many good things, for, certainly for me, out of the pandemic, which is our experience, right? what we're doing yeah, right now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, allowed, it's allowed me the opportunity to be in actual contact with all these wonderful people, musicians and music lovers and so forth around the world. And it's changed my life. You know, completely changed my life. I agree. I, I started doing these talks with, with, you know, with people I listened to for the last 25 years. Like, you know, I've talked to Bill Frizzell and, or, <laughs> you know, like he's, he's the hero, man, or some, you know, Joe Lovano or, yeah. You know, Matt, Matt Ship or uh, William Parker or like the entire scene, you know, drummers, like everyone. And it's just like, you know, Eric Harlan the other day and Clarence Spann. And, you know, th- th- those are people who are, like, you know, and Myers. I played with many of them. And it's just like to hear stories like that. I- I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm a music lover and musician, but I-, I love the, you know, the history, the, you know, this little herbs and spices that that make this unique, I guess. I hope. I yeah, think. for sure. For sure. Yeah.
Yeah. But uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, George Benson now, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I spoke the other day with Rodney Jones. We did a talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, Rodney and George, they, they became friends through time also. And uh, uh, Rodney visited Benson at his home. And then he told me once that because I, I don't think Benson did a solo guitar record ever official. And uh, Rodney Jones said that, you know, when he heard Benson play solo guitar, like standards or whatever, it sounded like the shit out there. Like it was Joe Pass on the most incredible level. Sure. And I wanted to ask you, how was like your experience? Because I know, you know, I've read the liner notes here that you also, you and George kind of hooked together and uh, like, yeah. how was your experience with him? And even his approach, did you ever hear him play solo guitar also on standards? And Sure, sure. Translate this into your playing. We, I heard you on that Red Sofa concert, and you know, <laughs> sophisticated lady, man. I was like, damn. And you know, Amazing Grace is just like such an inspiration. I was like, man, I, I oh, thank you. Get my chops together more. So. Oh <laughs> yeah, no, 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 man. It's 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 all it's 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 a it's a living, breathing thing. So yeah, yeah. So we either grow or we deteriorate, you know, and, and, yeah. and, it, and, it can, and it's a, and it's a daily struggle. Like I've, I've been working really hard the last few months. So my playing is growing, but all it takes is one week of not doing it. And yeah. go, <laughs> right. Like yeah. it just, yeah. it's not like you do it and you're there, you know? And yeah, so, sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, I am, you know, I am intimately aware of Rodney and George's relationship because, uh, um, you know, I know Rodney got to know George when as Rodney was a teenager. You know, and I'm a fan of Rodney's, and and and, and obviously, you know, and, and I, I spent, I had a very interesting experience with George and Russell Malone when Rodney Rodney Jones's record for Blue Note, his first his first major oh, yeah. label came yeah. out. Eric Harlan was playing drums. Those guys, it's funny yeah. mentioning how he's playing and. and George and Russell and I all went to the club to, to opening night and sat in the front table and, and you know. Oh, really. Them. And Robbie blew, I mean, obviously he blew our minds. We already knew what he could do, but it was just on steroids, you know. Uh, um, my, you know, my experience with George was much more, uh, um, way more apprentice master than I think Rodney's was like, you know, younger brother, you know, because they're, they're not that far apart in age. Rodney's in his early 60s, George, or mid 60s, George's in his 70s, you know. So uh, um, I met George uh, in, um, October of 1987. Like I said, I was playing at the at that at that uh, at the Blue Note and the Late Night Band. And every year at that time, uh, they would have a, they had a weekly, a week long anniversary celebration. It was during that that week uh, of October uh, with, with, for for the uh, for that location where it is now. They've been there, so they must have opened it in 1981 because this was the sixth anniversary, right? And so uh, uh, it must have been someplace else, someplace else in the city before that. Anyway, um, just to give you an idea of what the what the musical landscape was like in the city right, at that time, the guy hosting the week was Billy Eckstein. It was Billy Eckstein and his trio. His oh. guests were Tony Bennett and Sarah Vaughn. Right? Oh, okay. They were they were his guests for opening night for Tuesday night at the Blue Note. Uh, and and of course, the club was full of people who were coming to play. Henry Butler was there, and much other people were there to play. And uh, instead of the late night band coming on at one a.m. to play to play our two sets till four a.m. The owners decided to have us sticking around to play during the intermissions. So Billy X time would play 45 minutes and then come off the stage and we would go up and just kind of play, you know, while everybody partied and did their thing for, you know, 30 minutes or so and then come off to the, and then to the second set. So, uh, so that took, he played his first set and, and we got up there and we, you know, we did our thing and came off the set and whatever. And, and then, uh, and then uh, he was going back up and Tony Bennett was singing and Sarah Vaughn was there. And, George Best, and his, George Best and his wife walked in, and uh, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's George Benson!" You know, he walked, and you know, I'm just standing there, and, 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 and you know, George is magnanimous. You know, he's talking, to him, "Hey, brother, blah, 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 you know, talking to everybody." He sat down. <laughs> One of the club owners comes over to me and he says, "Hey, man, uh, you know, George is here. And he wants to sit in." Um, but uh, he didn't have his guitar. Do you mind if he uses yours? I'm like, no, of course not. I said, but can you please just introduce me to him? You know, come on. He says, yeah, all right. So we walk over. He says, hey, George, this kid says you can use his guitar. You know, and so he's like, and I'm like, he's, and, 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 I, and, you know, I also had no, I had met his son because his son, Robert, started at Berkeley. So Robert's first year was my last year. Oh, so I said, okay. 
And he said, hey, so now, I just, I didn't even know what to tell you about how great, you know, how, what, what, who you are to me, but I'm also one of Robert's classmates. I just finished at Berkeley, and he was like, oh, man. And of course, and Jenny's wife got all excited. Oh, you know, you know, why my son Robert, blah, blah, blah. And so George is playing, it's my Ibanez lawsuit model, right? And he's playing it, and he says, now, brother, let me tell you something. Every time I see one of these guitars, I buy it. You know, and I, and I, I was like, well, man, you can't, you can't buy my guitar. Wait, wait a minute. How, how much money are we talking about here? Oh, man. <laughs> right? And so, so anyway, you know, he's, 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 I mean, he's sitting there playing. I was like, oh, my God. Like, I didn't know if my guitar could do that. Right? And so, so then uh, Johnny, his wife, Johnny May, she sees me looking at him like this. And she says, well, so you're not going to play tonight, are you? And I was like, I, I have to play, I have to, you know? And so anyway, uh, so George went up and he played Billy's Bounce and What's New. Oh man. Wow. Just like the record with Herbie, right? You know, and so he play, he plays Billy's Bounce and What's New. And he, and I mean, and he, he was, he stretched on both of them, you know, singing and playing and just, you know, oh. all, you know and soloing and just, he, the whole, in two songs, he put his entire, his entire master, you know, jazz guitar, uh, yeah. entire PhD up on, in, on display, right? And so, and he comes off and hands me the guitar and I swear it was, it was like red hot, right? And he says, he says, little brother, I'd love to stick around and hear you play, but my wife and I, we got, we got some place to go. So I'll, I'll catch you some other time, right? So now imagine this, dude, I'm on fire, right? I'm inspired. My hero just played my guitar. You know, I want to play really bad. He's leaving, so I'm not nervous. I'm excited. Then I went up on stage and played the best guitar I'd played up to that point in my life. Little did I know he never left. He was hiding behind the podium at the front door so I wouldn't see him. Oh, man. And so uh, he just stood back there. And, and, after, and so when I came off the stage, there was a note for me. He said, man, brother, that was mean. That's, you know how George says, brother, that was mean. You played great. Uh -huh. wow. And, and I'm going to come back next week and see you again. And so uh, like, man, like clockwork, the following Tuesday, Bob James was playing with his band. You know, they're old friends. And so uh, George showed up, sat in with Bob James. And then after the, after, then he and Bob sat out with a bottle of champagne, talking, you know, talking to whatever. And they, and they watched the, the late night band. And George sat right in front of me and watched me play all that. Now, the one thing about me is, I'm not the kind of person, I've never been the kind of person who gets nervous uh, uh, in that way and then can't play or can't do, you know, That's like, good. Yeah. I get excited about it. And I, you know, I, I might be, I might be too, you know, like, too yeah. hyperactive, but I'm not going to get, you know, I don't, I don't fold. So just whatever, just it's a personality thing. So I just started playing. I probably didn't play as well as I played the week before because he was looking right at me, but I definitely played, you know, I gave, I gave him my best, you know, and, and, and uh, so he said to me, he said, well, you know what, man, um, you need to play. He said, and I was playing with other young guys. And he said, you know, playing with young guys is cool. You know, it's great. And you guys are all wonderful. He said, but you, you'll never get to the best of what you have to offer playing with guys your own age because they're not, they don't, they're not going to, they, even if they're better than you, and you know, they push you a little bit. The pressure's not on He said, man, you need pressure. He said, I can see you. He says, you know, you need to play with the great Jack McDuff. And I, and I had already met Jack. And let's just say I'd gotten a less than a less than a less than uh, fluffy, uh, 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 um, you know. Jack was Jack was a rough dude, right? And so old, old school, yeah, completely. Yeah, Jack was just yeah. like, yeah, whatever, kid, uh, you know. And so, but I didn't tell George that, right? So George says you need to go join Jack McDuff's band, and and I was like, okay. And so he said, he said, I'm going to Europe. I'll be back in a month. When I come back, I'm gonna go. We we'll go up to we we'll go up to Harlem together, and I'll introduce you to Jack. But man, this was 1987, dude, and I was hungry to play. I wasn't waiting for George to come back. So the next day, I found out where Jack was playing, and I went to Harlem myself. And I uh -huh. went up, and he was sitting outside. Never forget, I got to the club, and there was Jack sitting outside in the van smoking a joint. You know, and he, and, and he was probably yelling at somebody, right? And so I walked up to him, and I said, excuse me, Mr. McDuff? And he was like, what? You, what? I was like, man, why does everybody always ask me that? <laughs> and he's like, what do you want? And I said, you know, I'm a guitar player, and, and I, want, I want to come up and audition to play in your band. Oh, he, said, he says, you know what? He said, my guitar player is quitting, so you know what? You're in luck. He said, uh, uh, he said, he said you got to come by my apartment tomorrow. Be, be, by my, be, be at my apartment tomorrow at 10 a.m. And oh, he said, wow. you know, Lennox Terrace, you know, whatever. Doorman will send you up. I said, okay, great, no problem. So, you know, 10 a.m., uh, I'm there bright and early, you know, and I lived in Brooklyn, so that meant I had to come all the way into the city. This is I, like probably, you know, a full 60 minutes on the train right, with my sure. car. So I, I get up there, and I, and I knock on the door at 10, and Jack, Jack isn't home yet. He's still been out from partying the night before. 
Oh, shit. So his, so his lady, his girlfriend, uh, she, you know, B, she let me in. She says, oh, hey, baby, you here to see Jack? And I was like, yeah. She said, well, he ain't back yet. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, so, you know, and, I, and, had, and you know, I was young, so it didn't even dawn on me what kind of shape this dude was going to be in when he got home. But the funny thing is, he was fine. Jack uh -huh. got home. He, when he walked in the door, he was like, oh, you here? He got there about 11, 11, 30. You know, I, I waited. She, you know, she, she made me some breakfast. You know what I mean? It was real old school. You know, so we sat down in this little music room. We had his organ and whatnot. And he pulled out all these charts. I mean, you know, Jack was a prolific writer. But the charts were in bad shape, bro. Like, the charts had like sure, Can you imagine that? Blood stains. What I'm looking at, a bullet hole. Oh, man. And, you know, the charts were in bad shape. And so, uh, uh. You know, and like incomplete, there were things that had been changed, you know, and a big thing, he kept asking me if I could read, you know, I'm like, yeah, I can read, all right, you know, so I, I'm reading the charts or whatever, but everything wasn't there, and, and, and so yeah, he's like, well, uh, I don't have time, and basically what he meant was he was tired, hung over, right, I don't have time to teach you the rest of this music, so if my saxophone player will teach you the rest of the stuff, you can join the band and you can start with us tonight. Oh man! Wow. You know, or, or, or you start with us tomorrow night. It was the next night, right? I was like, oh, oh, okay. So we called the saxophone player from his apartment. We called a guy's name is Andrew Beal, still a very good friend of mine. We called Andrew, and Andrew, uh, uh, he was like, yeah, all right. You the guy that came by last night? And I was like, yeah. And I, I don't know. He must have just had a good feeling about me. He was like, all right, well, man, come on by. I'll show you. So now I got to go. He lived in Greenpoint. So now I got to go all the way back past my place, all the way out to Greenpoint to his place, right? And I get there, and and uh, he and his, you know, and, and Andrew is maybe you know five or six years older than me, and his and his girlfriend at the time the same, you know. And so, so um, he took his time and showed me like all the all the intricacies like of like the you know the top twenty charts, you know. And and remember now, there's no we didn't have cell phones and cameras, anymore. so I had a Walkman. I had to record this on a cassette, like, you know, and go home and like, and, and speed it up and let, you know, slow it down, you know, I mean, fast forward, slow it to, you know, get all these parts down. Uh, all right, but I did it, you know, and so I'm on the gig. So now I'm on the gig for two weeks, three weeks, however long it was, George Benson, true to his word, he's coming back as he, he was flying in from Europe and George loved to show off, especially with Jack, right? So he calls the club from the, from, from the airplane. He called Showman's from the airplane, and and uh, and apparently he told Jack, "Hey man, I'm on my way. I'm gonna get in my car. I'm coming straight to see you." And so so Jack came up to the stage. He said, "Man, that George Benson is too much. He just called me from the airplane. You know, they got a play, they got a phone on the plane. You know, that's how Jack talked. You know what he said? And he said he's coming up here. And I was like, "Holy smokes, George is coming here!" And so George came, parked his Rolls Royce on the sidewalk so nobody would scratch it, right? And came in, and came in the club. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God, it's George Benson. And he's and, and George looked, he was like, brother, you already here? And I was like, I was like, yeah, man, I couldn't wait. I said, I said, I can't He's like, man, okay, what are we gonna do? So then, so then uh, uh he sat in, you know, and oh, and, wow, man. and and my you know, and I was struggling with my sound because Jack played really loud, right? I mean, all organs are loud, right? And so I had and I had the, I had the Orange Q100 amplifier, which was a you know half a jazz course, lousy amp, right? But it was loud. And 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 my and, and my and my uh, lawsuit model, Ibanez. I didn't have any pedals. I didn't, you know no no kind. And so my sound was raw and not real good, right? Uh, uh, and George sat in. I handed him my guitar. I turned my head, and he adjusted the settings. And when I turned around, I was like, oh great. And and. Uh, and they started playing, and he played two songs, and man, yeah. not only was killing, but my sound was, I was yeah. like, oh, he fixed my sound, this is great. So, bro, when he handed me back the guitar, I looked at the amp so I could see what he had done. He hadn't changed a thing. Didn't change, didn't turn a knob, nothing. It was all here. Fingers, yeah. And, I, and so I went, I went from, ah, to, <laughs> right, like, just done. When the gig was over. He said, all right, here's my number. Call me in the morning. I want you to come out to my house. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to get all that stuff together for you, you know. And so he picked me up. And I, 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 went, I, went, I took the train all the way back to Brooklyn. And then in the morning, I took the train to the World Trip, to, um, to, G to George Washington Bridge, because he lived in Englewood. And he picked me up in his Rolls Royce. He picked me up, went out to his house. Nah. Right? And I spent eight hours at his house. It was just two of us sitting like this, right, just, you know, with, 
He had, he had a, 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 a recording studio in the basement, and there was a vault off to the side, uh, uh, temperature control, the whole thing, with full of guitars. I mean, there must have been 50, 60 guitar cases in there. You know, Gold Top, Les Pauls, sure. he, had, he had Grant Green's The Aquisto, like stuff like that in there, you know. And so did I hear him play solo guitar? Dude, he just sat in front of me for hours playing guitar unaccompanied with his thumb. And it was so fast and so clean. And he had, he had counterpoint and, and, yeah, and yeah. contrary motion and bass lines. And he would tune, he tuned, he played, he did almost the entire thing with the, with the, with the low E string tune. It turns out he, Johnny Smith was his hero. He, he had transcribed all this Johnny Smith. Oh he, man, really? Man. And so, yeah, you know, he, yeah. and so you wouldn't think that, right? He, he knew all this Johnny Smith. He knew, he knew a bunch, he knew all these Tal Farlow solos. He, you know, he had learned a bunch of jank. He knew, he knew every, he knew any, every note Charlie Christian played. He, he knew. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so he just started playing all that stuff for me, and then he had it was one of those. George is one of those people who um, theory, music theory was was created to explain what he plays, not he learned music theory to learn how to play. George's ear leads him through the harmony and through all these advanced concepts. Uh, he's one. Of, he's just one, one of those once in a generation guys, you know. Yeah. And so um, he, you know, we talk, He showed me all kinds of things. And it's funny, I went, I was in, uh, you know, he lives in Arizona now, right? And so I went out and I played International Jazz Day this past one, April 30th in, in Arizona. And I accepted the gig just because I knew George was there. You know, I, could, right? I got my vaccination. I was like, I'm going to, I want to see George, you know? And so I got to spend three days with him, you know? Oh, really? And, oh, man, yeah. that's beautiful. You know, and, and one of the things he said to me, he was like, man, he says, you know, back when you first started coming over to the house, he said, I, my thought was, to talk to you about changing a few things. He said, but then I realized, you know what? If I let this brother find his own way, he said, instead of playing like me, you'll learn, you'll, he said, there was, something, there was something very original about about you. And I, I took it as a compliment, but I, I gotta be honest, my originality was just because I didn't really know what he was doing. Like I didn't, I didn't really understand. I wanted to copy him, I wanted to copy Wes, I wanted to copy Grant and Kenny Brown, I wanted to copy Joe. But I just, you know, I didn't know what they were doing really. So I got as close to it as I could. And then I just made it my own, you know, and, and, and I stuck with it and kept doing it until, you know, I added some harmony and theory and things and some knowledge to my ideas and it became my own style. But trust me, I wanted his style. I didn't want my style, you know, uh, uh, uh. but it, I was really grateful for him, to him for that. And I'm telling this long story because it reminded me when we talk about his, my experience as opposed to Rodney's. Rodney plays a lot like George, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and Rod, Rodney was, you know, coming into his own as a musician while George was at the height of his popularity. George's guitar sound was everywhere and it was the new thing. You know, by the time uh, I got to Berkeley in 1983, you know, and started playing, uh, there were so many prominent guitar players and so many things and, and, and so much stuff going on. It wasn't just George, it was Mike Stern and John Schofield and Joe Pass was still playing. And, you know, and I, I got to play, I played with Johnny Smith once. I got to play with Tal Farlow and I got, and Larry, you know, they were all, I had all these great influences uh, uh, from around me. And so, and because I was in school, as opposed to being in New York trying to work, I had, I had an environment where I could, I could pay attention to each one of them and, and not, have, not feel weird about it. You know, like if you're working, if you're trying to survive, like Rodney was, you got to play what's popular because you're trying to get high. Yeah. Sure. You know, so and so for me, I didn't have that pressure. I was just trying to get to class, right? And so I could, you know, I went through a, I went through a real Mike Stern period where I played nothing. I, really? You know, oh man! And oh Mike man! Got, really? Yeah, Mike and I got me really, we got me really close. Wow. But I, well, my freshman year at Berkeley, the man with the horn came out. Yeah, sure. Right? So, man, that time, dude, are you kidding me? I had never heard, I, I don't, you know, no one had ever heard anything like that. You know, Mike Stern was a, was a unicorn. And so, and so, uh, um, oh, yeah, I had a bunch of drat, my distortion pedal and my chorus pedal. And you couldn't tell me shit about that, man. I was all in it, you know. And, and, oh, wow, man. And, and then, of course, Kevin Eubanks' record, first record came out, Guitarist. Man, I, was, I love uh, Kevin's point, yeah. And when I heard when I heard guitarist, I think that's the that's the thing probably the single most uh, important uh, detail that uh, when it comes to what kept me from sounding exactly like George, it's that when I heard Kevin, it was something about Kevin Eubanks that took me off off that old off the traditional path and put me onto him. Yeah, yeah, and I could man even to this day I, I still call Kevin you know once a month I'm like Kev what are you doing? I really hey, 
you know, I'm working on this thing, and he, you know, and and and, and uh, I'm like his most loyal disciple. You know what I mean? It's just, and 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 it's it's, a, and it's amazing because we don't really play alike. You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a much more inside straight ahead player than he is. Uh, uh, uh. Although when he played straight ahead, he plays great. Oh yeah, man, sure. Yeah, it's it's opening nights, were killing. Yeah, yeah. killing records of all time. But uh, um, uh, a lot of the a lot of the things that he experiments with, I see him through the, through his eyes. So I've gotten back to playing with effects and pedals, and not all the time. Excuse me. No, sure. I do, excuse me. I do. Incorporate those things into what I'm doing into my playing, and and and, okay. and, I, and I have a real, you know, I I'm more into f envelope filters than I am, am into distortion, but I use them both, you know, and I get into that kind of stuff, and 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 uh, um, you know, and I and I and seeing and having two real mentors like that, George and Kevin, has been has been been the greatest one of the greatest things you know in my life. Man, I, I didn't know that about Kevin. I mean, I, I knew about George, but like you know, yeah. Kevin is those Spirit Talks albums, man. Oh. That's oh. That's a composition wise, like you know, yeah. the, 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 the odd meters, and I'm like, man, how, how do you do that? You know, it's so yeah. effortless, and it's, it's yeah, like, yeah. But uh, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you this because you mentioned Mike Stern now, and let's say 80s, you know, fusion is at the height of his whatever, you know, all these guys, Scott Henderson, Frank Gambali, and uh, this jazz fusion, Schofield, then slowly going straight, straight ahead, but. You know, you you come out with the Marksman, nineteen ninety, and then later this beautiful albums. I mean, and you kind of kept this modern style of yours, but still in a tradition. And I wanted to ask you, how did you find your voice in, in this like you know sea of guitarists, like musically? How was that for you? Uh, well, yeah, you know, it's the funny thing is, uh, um, so uh, I, I was really affected by Mike. Stern and John Schofield when it comes to the fusion guys. Mm. A lot, you know, Frank Frank Gambale and, and and Scott Henderson, while they're wonderful, uh, I was already kind of playing by the time they got on the scene. So they didn't uh, yeah, they, yeah they, they didn't have any influence on me really. Uh, um, uh, you know John Abercrombie <sighs> is someone, it's, you, know, you know he's a genius for me. My, you know? my hero, yeah, my, my, yeah. And, and uh, you know I I've always loved Pat Metheny's playing and his music, but he's not. He didn't play straight enough. Straight ahead. He didn't play enough straight ahead for me to get into his music, right? So I, it, he didn't really affect my playing. There are sometimes you'll hear me with some extra delay and reverb and stuff, and I like that. I like that space in my sound, and that's definitely as a result of listening to Pat for sure. But the, but the notes themselves don't really come from him. Um, uh, I, in fact, one of my favorite uh, guitar performances of all time. Um, I think my cassette tape finally went bad, but I, I was at Berkeley when he came there to play with Ornette Coleman to do Song oh, X. Yeah, Song X, one of my and best I, records, yeah. favorite and records. I, I, had bootleg, I had a bootleg of the concert. Oh, my, really? For my, my, my Sony Pro Walkman. I, I, with that's, Jack on drums? And... Yeah, with Jack, it was Jack and, and, and uh, Ornette's nephew playing electronic drums. Jack, oh, Charlie Hayden, oh, yeah, Jack, yeah. Hayden, Pat, and, and Ornette, and, and, and oh, man. man. That's, so, now, Pat and I never really talked about that much. But I let him know when I first, you know, when I first started to see him or I would talk to him that 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 was that that that's the avant-garde guitar bible for me. Like you know, here, here somebody play with here him play the vocabulary he developed to play with Ornette, hands down, bar none. You know, uh, yeah. but anyway, um, I didn't believe that learning something from here. Learning, learning something from Mike Stern, like learning a phrase he played on Jean Pierre, for instance, could only be played there. Yeah. Like I, you know, learning like my favorite John Schofield album. I mean, obviously everybody loves Decoy. You know, he, what that solo he played on the on Miles record is 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 is, is legendary. Yeah. But my favorite Schofield record is still Warm. Oh yeah. You know, and 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 and, and you know, and and so hearing him play those weird altered phrases and those things kind of over the changes, I was like, okay. They don't need to be played just there, right? So I would look, hear a phrase that I like, you know, beep boop, deep boop, deep boop, deep boop, deep boop, deep boop, da. This is one long, long sort of bebop blues that he plays at the end of this phrase. I was that tune, but but beep it out. You like, how did that come from? You know, and 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 so I, you know, I learned all that. And then you know, I'd be, you know, but then when I got to, but I also started at Berkeley with Wynton Marcellus's little brother Delphio. We started, and so 
there was this thing. I knew I wasn't going to be a rock and roll guy. Like I was, you know, first of all, there was a guy named Al Petrelli, a guitar player who lived down the hallway from me at Berkeley. And I think he was already playing with Ozzy Osbourne while we were in school. I mean, this, this dude, if there was ever going to, I mean, Steve Vai couldn't do shit for this guy. I mean, you know what I mean? Al Petrelli, he, uh, he could do things with a six string, you know, with six strings, bro. Like you just, I, I, yeah, tapping and all this. He was doing that in 1984. Like it just, I mean, people talk about Van Halen. Van Halen was great, but that was, that was for show, right? He was a show guy. This Al Petrelli was like trained oh, wow. on this shit. Like, and so uh, I knew I couldn't, I was like, well, I can't, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> you got that, bro. <laughs> you know, and the fusion thing, um, it seemed, even to me, it seemed like it was ending. Yeah, it's dated, yeah. Yeah, it seemed like, it seemed like it started coming. And you have to remember, I got to Berkeley at age 16. Like I, so I was young. Oh, wow, man. Berkeley, yeah. And young in the scene. So at 16, you know, this new guy, Wynton Marcellus, was, was, was getting all, you know, Black, Black Holes had, got, it, I, I, it went, yeah, I'm 16, that's 1982, 83. So the record before Black Holes had come out, you know, and, and Wynton was on the Grammys, but he didn't win. Miles won that year, you know, and, and, I, and I remember seeing Wynton, seeing Wynton, but I was like, man, what the fuck are these dudes, man? It's, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. and, I, and I heard him talk. He's like, yeah, you know, acoustic music and Miles and, and Train and, and you know, and, and, and Duke Ellington and Thelonious Monk. And, you know, and I was like, man, who is this, who is this young dude talking about, you know, talking about 80-year-old music like it was yesterday? I got to, you know, and then I heard them play and I was like, oh. Yeah. You know, I heard Kenny Kirkland and Jeff Watts and Bradford. I was like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. This this is a modern this is this is not old this is not the Smithsonian these cats are on just you know and so I started getting into getting into that that approach of playing and Winton you know even told me himself many times I, I I'm not, he just doesn't really like this he doesn't like the sound of the guitar especially as a as a solo voice instrument he could he could, he could deal with it like you know some Danny Barker and rhythm yeah system. yeah yeah he was all about piano and horns that's just what he hears you know. And Kevin, you know, Kevin Eubanks and Branford were very close. And so uh, um, I, I watched them play sometimes and I'd be like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta figure out, I gotta get in there, you know, like this thing I gotta do. And so uh, um, that became my really, sort of my, my, but the sound was just, I, I figured if I got the guitar stripped it down to its purest possible sound, but still amplified, I could somehow fit into that conception. I could fit in with those guys. And, but they were, you know, they played, their vocabulary was wide. You know, Winton played mostly Miles stuff at that time. Bradford played a mixture of Sonny Rollins and and, and, yeah. and Wayne Shorter. And Kenny Kirkland played some Herbie, some McCoy, some, you know, whatever he was playing. And and nobody knew what the fuck Jeff Watts was playing. We were just, <laughs> It's it wasn't even Elvin at that point. It was just, it was just Tony and, some, and Jack and like Fusion and all this weird Incredible. Thing. Yeah. But but he had but they had this jazz aesthetic, you know, and and it seemed like they all were getting more and more into straight ahead as they got older, as opposed to the fusion guys who all kind of started out playing straight ahead and got into fusion. You know, Winton was getting deeper and deeper into the trumpet tradition. Bradford was getting deeper into you know, but you know like that that record trio GP is a, is, yeah, a, is man, a yeah. masterpiece of jazz saxophone, you know, and so yeah. like. Uh, uh, you know, and, and clearly Kenny Kirkland and Jeff Watts were growing and growing. You know, you started hearing more Monk and Kenny's playing, and 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 more Frankie Dunlop and Elvin and, and Tane's playing as as it went on. And so we all sort of followed their lead. You know, all the all the young guys who wanted to play straight ahead. I was like, man, I want. I'm down with these guys. You know, and then you know they're wearing their nice suits and, and getting record deals. And I was like, man, I got this is for me. You know, how can I get in? And so um, I was actually working something with Winton. Uh, um, not not in his in his in his working septet, but I played on the Tune In Tomorrow soundtrack with his band, and and Winton liked me. He didn't like my instrument, but he liked me as a person, and 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 he and he and he could tell that I just worshipped him. Like I you know I just was crazy about every you know I, I hung on his every word, and like for instance uh, you know he was. Um, he was si still signed to Columbia Records when they discovered the Robert those lost Robert Johnson tapes, and long before the record came out, Winton gave me a cassette of Robert Johnson. Oh man! Said, you know, I was playing with Jack McDuff, and so I'm playing. You know, I was playing the blues and whatever, but through that organ tradition, you know. And, and so, 
Winton, uh, that wasn't really Winton's thing. And so I remember him saying, yeah, you play in the blues, but you need to check this out. And he and he, he, made, he made a cassette for me. And the cassette was uh. Robert Johnson's record on one side, and the other side had, had a Howlin' Wolf record. And so, uh, and I think that's, Winton Marcellus, think about that, Winton Marcellus gave me Robert Johnson the Howlin' Wolf. So I was like, oh, okay. So, the, you know, the blues is about a feeling for sure, but it's also about a tradition. There's a language here that, that has, you know, that, that the further and further we get away from the way it was played, you know, in the Delta, the more and more, the, you know, blues may have influenced rock and roll and all these things, but it comes back around and now rock and roll is influencing blues and all these things. And what's what was trying to say, man, if you want to get into this, you got to go back before Hendrix and before Stevie Ray Vaughan, you got to go back, you got to go back, but you know, uh, 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 even before Muddy Waters and before Timo yeah. Walker, you got to go back, you, you know, and, and, and really understand how this music was born and then see how it affects you. And, and, uh, and I, for some reason, man, that music, it just between Robert Johnson and Lightning Hopkins, man, I was, done right i just you know i just yeah. that's it for me and so my voice uh as a as a you know as a jazz guitar player is a combination of you know lightning hopkins and robert johnson jimmy smith and jack mcduff george benson and kenny burrell and joe pass and grant green uh kevin eubanks and mike stern and john Schofield. Like it's all in there. Can, yeah. and 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 it's it, and i guess it, it, it comes out of this funnel which is my sound and my approach. Like I play a, a hollow body with 13s, you know, and, 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 mm. you know, and, 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 and I, and, and, uh, and I only did that because my first guitar, when I bought that lawsuit model came with 13s on it. I didn't know. Mm. And I was a bass player. So I had strong hands. It didn't, I didn't, it didn't matter. Uh, uh, and I didn't realize that, uh, um, the reason other guys could play so fast and had and had all that 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 sweet pretty sound is they use light strings, you know. But sure. and by the time I tried, it sounded like I was playing on a ukulele. I mean, I, I you know I played too hard, you know, I couldn't do it, so I'm stuck with what I play. Uh, um, but uh, uh, you know, and that when you asked me how how did I carve out my sound, it was it was unconscious. It was very uh, non deliberate. It just you know I was like, hey, I, I like this. Hey, I like that. Hey, I like this, and I've never, I've never been one to deny what I like. You know, oh sure, are, yeah. Some cats, are like, you know, well, well, they they won't give it up, or they, you know, or they, or they you know, but if I like it, fuck it. If I like it, the way I look at it is, if I like it and I do it well enough, somebody else will probably like it too. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> right? that's kind of, that's kind of how, how I've always approached it. You know, yeah. I just wanted to ask you this also. You being a band leader, I mean, you know, when you did this album, you were like twenty. 28 maybe you know and you, you oh, have like that was roll what what year is that i think it's like, it's 90, like 95 90, right 90, 90, 90, probably so you know. i recorded it when i was 28 yeah sure so, i mean you have like you know like i don't know harlem nocturna and then you have you know dave holland and al foster yeah, and you know tommy yeah, flan again it's just like yeah well so the funny thing about that is so when we were making that record so i my, my first my first verb record is true blue right yeah sure and 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 uh, and that was a huge success for the label and for me, right? So we sold a lot of copies and whatever. And it was something that, that they didn't want me to do, you know. Uh, 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 that record, you know, um, uh, you know, Bradford and his band at the time were not known uh, for their uh, uh, medium swing hard blues playing. They, they could do anything, but they we were really popular. For that kind of for the sort of edgy you know yeah. burn up fast you know crazy things and so when i said i want to make when, when the guys at first said what do you want to do for the first record i said well i want to investigate my whole my my blues roots and i want to i said i want to go to la and use the tonight show band and they were like Bradford and, and kenny kirkland and jeff watts to play the blues are you kidding me and i was like i was like yeah i said you know you guys don't understand i, I don't want this record to sound like to sound like uh, I'm not trying to make a a, a a contrived stereotypical blues record, you know. When I'm not going to a hoedown, bro. Like I, they, trust me, I know. I, you know, I, I know what I want on this, and they and they were very reluctant. And of course, when it was done, they were just like this. You know, they loved it. You know, uh, we added Nicholas Payton and Rodney Whitaker to the mix, and it was just you know it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, but instead, it, it, so it, it, and so in my mind, instead of insisting. On what I was going to do with my second record, I was more open to their 
suggested stuff. He go, okay, now, now we know each other. What do you guys want me to do? And they said, well, we got, like to do something with some old guys and some young guys. And in hindsight, I should have just, I should have made two records instead of one. I should have done one full record with, uh, with McBride and, and, and Hutch. And, yeah. and, 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 and so the rhythm section for the other record was actually Hank Jones, Al Foster and Dave Holland. And Hank Jones had been on, on this tour called the 100, uh, uh, the 100 Fingers Tour, whatever it was. Um, it, it, 10 piano players uh, uh, on tour together in Japan. Oh, wow. and, and this woman and, and a waitress on a bullet train spilled a, a pot of scalding hot water in Hank Jones's lap oh, about two weeks before the recording session. And so uh, his, uh, he, he contacted the label and like, look, we, I know we had agreed, you know, I agreed to play with Whitfield. Because if people, a lot of people don't know, uh, one, of, one of Hank Jones's last records, I think it's called The Oracle, he is, is trio with Dave Holland and Al Foster, yeah. you know. And so, so there was there was a, there was a precedent for me, for me using those cats, you know. And so, and so, uh, uh, but the interesting thing is, the first sort of legendary guy piano player I never I never sat in with was Tommy Flanagan. Oh man, uh, okay. Guy, this guy named Angel, who, used to, who was kind of an operator, used to hang out, kind of a hustler around the jazz guys in in, in the eighties. And so he latched onto me. And, and I remember he, he, he said, man, I'm going to take you down to Bradley's so you can sit in with, Tom, with, with Father Flanagan. And I was like, Father Flanagan? Said, yeah, you know, that's what everybody calls Tommy Flanagan. It's, it's, it's an Irish name, like a priest, you know. And so anyway, I got down there. It was Tommy Flanagan and George Moraz playing duo. Oh, wow. wow beautiful. And, of course, I, I was not no way in the world I was going to sit in. Are you kidding me? I just want to watch them play. And so uh, this guy told Tommy Flanagan that I was there, that I wanted to play. And so... Uh, Next thing I know, I heard Tommy Flanagan talking. He says, "Yes, yeah, so we have a young man in the audience who's going to join up here, come up and play the guitar with us, and and uh, get him up here now." Uh, how about a nice hand from uh, what you say his name was? Uh, Mark Whitfield, right? And I was just like, uh, so I took my guitar out of the case and I walked real slow up to the piano, and he says, "Well, what do you want to play, uh, young man?" And I said, "Well, I'll play. How about Billy's Bounce?" You know, and of course it's just bird to him. He's like, he's like, "Oh, it's great," you know, and so. I played two tunes with Tommy Flanagan, you know, uh, and and I and I, I didn't belong there, but but I but he gave me the chance and I and I did well, you know, and so here this was coming full circle. It had never dawned on me to even think about reaching out to him, you know, and the label had contacted Hank Jones. So Hank Jones says, Well man, I you know, I, I'm in no I'm in no shape to play. I'm I'm recovering from this accident. I'm gonna send a sub. His sub was Tommy Flanagan. Wow, man. Amazing. Right, and so that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I had written all these all these songs. You know, I was, yeah. start, I was starting to get into composing. I mean, you know, and they're not. I mean, when I talk about myself as a writer, I, I you know, to me, there is a difference between someone who just kind of writes tunes and a composer. Someone, you know, and so I'm not a composer. You know, I, I don't have composing get composition chops where I get up and write music every day and, and get into the whole thing. But I, but I like to write tunes which are vehicles for me to play on. You know, I. Yeah. You know, I like to, you know, I'd like to create to create a soundscape, and I've gotten more into that as time is going on. Um, and so here I was, uh, almost feeling guilty asking Tommy Flanagan to play a couple of my tunes. You know, like like you know, and and mm -hmm. he, but it was great. He was he was a consummate gentleman. He was not in the best of health uh, at that time. So, uh, but he was playing a so and 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 I mean the most magical moment. Uh, or certainly one of the top two or three magical moments in my entire musical life is playing Autumn in New York. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 do it. Yeah, man, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Come on, like, you know, and I was, in, and, and at that time, I was into learning the verses, you know, so I learned, learned the verses. And so he was so impressed that I showed up and I, and I, and I knew the verse, you know, boo doo be da boo doo dee da 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 And he's like, oh, you know the verse? And so I just said, yeah. And so I, so I, I came in playing the verse, and and we didn't even rehearse it. I just started playing the verse, and and out of the verse I played, boo doo dee dee da. Uh, yeah. And he played that first chord, and I was like, ah. Oh. That's and it. That was, yeah. Yeah, one take, you done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so, yeah. so beautiful. It's, I don't know the businessman's bounce, like what you play. I mean, every every tune anyway. Yeah. Well, that that was such a that, that tune. You know, asking him to play that. I can, I can tell you, he's like, okay, so it's a blues, but it's 32 bars. All right, well, play it for me, you know, it's a, you know, and and yeah, you know, and and he brought such joy and integrity, you know, and I, I guess, you know, I'm reminded of him and also of Clark Terry, 
who, uh, you know, whom I, I, I was close with, you know, till the end of his life. And, you know, Clark, uh, I remember him, you know, talking about, you know, he was, he was, he was 90. He was like, yeah, man, hey, Whitfield, where are you? Because he was losing his eyesight. He's like, man, I'm working on this thing, trying to figure this out. And I was just like, wow. Yeah. That's what I want to be at 90 years old. If I get yeah. that, far, I still want to be learning stuff, you know, and still playing. And so I feel like, uh, you know, I just finished making a trio record with Bob Hurst and Jeff Watts. Uh, oh, really, man? Oh, man. And, and, um, uh, and oh, I, you man. know, yeah, I, I redid the Marksman just trio and then, and then there's some new tunes on there and some of their, some of their tunes. And, oh, man. And I feel like I'm playing the best guitar of my life right now. Well, and, when and is it I, coming I, out? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, we recorded it. We'll see. You know, it's, oh, yeah. oh. Well, I, I hope it comes out early spring. You know, oh, uh, super, um, man. Uh, um, but yeah, I just you know, and I'm doing, I'm doing, and I got more. I'm doing more recording. I did a duet, a duet record with my son Davis plays piano. We were, we we started during the pandemic, and and because he you know he, behind me, he he uh, he, oh, he had a recording and and uh, uh, that that he closed down during the whole, and he brought his he brought his Steinway Grand home. And so we turned our living room into a little recording studio. We yeah, recorded a cool album, and it's and it's really great playing. I'm really proud of that, and and, and of him and myself. And so, um, that's the thing, man. Is 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 uh, every moment is an opportunity, and 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 every and then once you once, and once the opportunity turns into a great moment, then you got you have to relish it. You got to live in it, you know, and then and then and let it carry you forward. And so I try I, I try not to get caught. Or stuck in a moment, and I try not to skip past them because you know some people are all oh that was great, but I'm not, but it's not you know you, you pass up all these great things looking for the big great thing, and you, really, you, look, you realize holy shit I just passed ten yeah. great things. Yeah, that's my one my one really you know my big goal as a human being is to learn how to really appreciate these big moments, these these opportunities, allow them to become moments, and then learn how to appreciate them and then carry them forward. You know, and, yeah. and, and that's so important. And, and as I as I do that, as I get better at that, I feel like I get better at life. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful, man. I, I, I have so many other questions, Mark, but I, I, you finished it so nicely here. I, I, you know, I don't want to dig further. Maybe next time. So. All right, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to talk to you. I've actually got to run and get ready to start teaching a lesson. Yeah. I appreciate you changing the time and stay Thank in you touch. So much. Doctor Jazz. Doctor Jazz. <laughs>